Welcome to an extra sports feature. This is the second of its kind. Thank you so much for the support on the first one we had with Sean D'Souza and we're going to be bringing more of these features to you. Today I'm joined by Dirk Villian and uh, some of you might know him as a cricket commentator. You might know him in the space of media, but he was actually a cricket player. <laughs> You wouldn't think so. You right? wouldn't think so at the present moment, but he was a cricket player, played for uh, the, the Chevrons, um, also did, played tests, played ODIs. Unfortunately, at this time, there were no T20s. I'm sure you would have loved to have played there uh, in the T20s with all of the rush that comes with it. But uh, he was an all-rounder in his own right as well. Uh, left-handed batsman, left-arm bowler, and was involved in quite a number of very uh, good encounters, close encounters for Zimbabwe, which we're going to talk about today. But Dirk, thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So Dirk, let's start off with your with your career uh, from the foundational aspects. I know that your your dad played a very huge role in terms of you getting into cricket. Uh, but were there other options? outside of cricket that you may have actually fallen into had the cricket bug not bit you? It, it's an easy one to answer, but, but it's quite difficult as well. So my father was a cricketer himself. He, he never played for Zimbabwe, but you know he played country districts in those days. Uh, he was educated in the Midlands and, and did the Craven League stuff and all that back in those days. And it, I guess his passion just rolled on to me. It's no different to, I, I, I hope I don't offend anyone, but I'm a Liverpool supporter. And the main reason, yeah. the main reason being is because my dad supports Liverpool. So I, I guess when you grow up, you, you follow what your family does. And, and for my dad, even though he never went on to represent his country, he just had a passion for cricket. And, and I guess I got that back. Um, I, I, I was very lucky, in, and I see it nowadays in, in a lot of children, uh, and, and anyone out there listening about how talented your kids are, my father only had two rules. His first rule was, whatever you do, and he was talking specifically to cricket, if I see you not enjoying it, I'm not coming in. I'm not coming to support you. Uh, he lived 300, 300 kilometers out of town from where I went to school. So for him to come in, it was a burden. It was hard for him to attend my cricket. I was at boarding school. And, and that rings clear to me today from when I was 13 years old because now I have a son who plays himself. Um, that was the first thing he said to me. The second thing he said to me, he said, if you're committed to this and you want to make it work, I'll give you all the support you need. I was very lucky in that because my dad had a, a very good understanding of the game, even though he might not have been the best cricketer, I learned a lot from him. I was very lucky in the sense that if I was going through some bad time in, in my batting or my bowling, that my dad could help. And I think that was a very unique scenario that I took for granted. When I finished school uh, at Eaglesvale in 95, uh, I had three options. Um, at the end of 95, I, I captained Zim schools uh, to the uh, Craven Week in those days. I don't think it had changed to Coca Cola. And, and I got selected as an unofficial protein. Um, I wasn't allowed to be selected in the side because obviously I had a Zimbabwe passport, but I was acknowledged at their selection dinner uh, and handed a protea tie to say that out of the whole of the selection process for a week, if we had picked the best team to pick a South African side, you would have made it. So he has an acknowledgement for your efforts, but you can't make the side. Through that, at that week, I got given a scholarship to go to Rhodes University to captain the uh, cricket side and the hockey side. Uh, full scholarship, pick whatever you want to study, uh, all on the house. Uh, and stupidly, for some unknown reason, I wanted to be an architect. Um, knowing which sort of half put me off, it was a seven year um, sort of studying period, which I wasn't so excited about. Uh, so I had that as an option. Uh, obviously, because my dad was a tobacco farmer, uh, I thought maybe going into the tobacco industry was quite interesting. And I guess because of how my last year of cricket had gone and, and I knew a couple of people, uh, I had an option to go and play club cricket. Interesting enough, the same club that uh, Andy Flower played at, Ron Flower and Gus Mackay, who all represented Zimbabwe, and they were looking for a pro. So I had three options. 
The first one that fell away was the university degree because in the end Rhodes University didn't offer architecture. So that was an easy decision to say, well, I'm not just going to go and study something arbitrary, so I'm out. Uh, I was left with the two options. Uh, and in the space of two days, I decided to take up a contract in the UK to go and play for a club called Bond Green in, in sort of between Warwickshire and Worcester um, in the Midlands League. Um, and the rest of it was history. Uh, and my sort of career started, I, I did a year there, I came back. I did another year in the UK, came back, and then did a year in Australia in Adelaide. And then once I'd sort of got into a sort of more a consistent position in the side, uh, travelling for me was just too much, so, so I did away with that kind of stuff. I remember in those days as well, in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there wasn't a T20 tournament. We didn't get a, a gig to go and play the IPL or the CPL or, or whatever it might have been. You were either an overseas pro or you are playing for your country. So things were a lot different there, but that's basically how I got to my career. Well, I mean, interesting times, uh, particularly in terms of going towards Australia. Uh, I believe there was a time that you were uh, given the award of the top young cricketer here in Zimbabwe. And I believe ultimately that is what then spurred on all of this. Uh, but talk about um, your first class career here in Zimbabwe and maybe in comparison to um, how it kind of feels like now. I mean, there's a whole, been a whole lot of talk about how the first class here in Zimbabwe is not at the level that it should be. Quite a lot of youngsters are being thrown into the fray uh, very quickly without having gone through the structures because the club system maybe is just not strong enough to then support the franchise system. I, I've got to be very careful on how I answer that question because I, I have no doubt that people that are watching the show and, and don't know me very well, if, if you Googled my career, and, and, and I know you're going to get to it on potentially, if I look back at my career, what were the low points. Um, as much as I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be, in, and the great thing about cricket, it's a team sport. If it was an individual sport, my, my stats don't matter. My stats aren't good. Um, so it's very difficult for me to comment about what's currently happening. However, I think that I'm old enough and I'm experienced enough that my comments are not a dig. My comments are, I can see the wood from the trees. I'm sitting on the outside. So my opinion on where Zimbabwe cricket is, is that opinion only on if it was me, I'd do things differently. As opposed to, remember, why aren't you scoring 100 every week? Because you could very easily go for Juven. So, so again, it comes down to opinion. Um, I was actually asked a couple of weeks ago about the current Zimbabwe structure and, and maybe where the problems are and, and Hamilton Masakadze have been tasked to go and find that solution. Maybe a little bit of history on how Zimbabwe cricket operated in our days. So the national team used to generally practice on a Friday evening. And in those days, the, the practice sessions used to be on the current rugby field at the back of Harare Sports Club. There were nets there. And the national team used to come and train there. And what they did was the national team would train sort of, I can't remember the exact times, but like four o'clock onwards. And they had these like squads of excellence. Again, it was very easy. It was Harare centric because Bulawayo had their own structures because you're in there longer than East Streets and North Deckers. And Adam Huckles all trained in Bulawayo. But the Harare setup was. That Zimbabwe cricket had established a sort of um, understanding of junior cricketers that were maybe going to be the ones that would follow through. So that Friday afternoon started at about 12 o'clock and they started with the junior setups, then the slightly older setups, slightly older setups, to three to four and sometimes into that session the under 19s would come into it. And sometimes they were integrated into the national team practices. That was one thing that I believe really went a long way because as a youngster, when you were seeing Andy Flower and John Flower and Dave Houghton in practice, that was the inspiration you needed because you went to practice and you were thinking to yourself, that's what I want to be one day. There was none of this, well, the national team practice, so you juniors going to do your own thing. There was a very clear indication of how it was all established together. And I think the main reason was because in those days there were only really four professionals, Andy Flower, Grant Flower, Dave Felton and Alistair Campbell. They would come and coach us. 
when, when I, and th this sort of also tells you the age bracket between us. When I did my under 13 trials at Prince Edward, I can't remember the age, and I'm not going to tell anyone because you'll know how old I am. My coach for Mashana was an under I ended up playing with him as my captain. Um, and who would have known? I don't think there's enough of that. I don't think there's enough of that aspirational scenario where you're taking a, a, a Brennan Taylor or a Sean Williams or a, 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 whoever it might be, a Reggie Chikata, and integrating them in these junior structures to ensure that, don't forget that one day that was you many years ago. And the way that you got to national level because you had that same assistance from current international players. So there's two sides to it. There's an educational side for the youngster because he's learning from a guy who's been there and done that. There's also an educational, personal education. Because when you're training someone else, you learn things yourself. And even if you're only learning how to talk to other people or how to integrate in society, I'm not saying that no one can integrate, but there's so many little life lessons that you learn from both sides. That was one thing they did. When we then got to an age of going, right, you are now holding up to play provincial cricket. Remember that in our days there were only three teams. There was Matabin Lane, Ashan Lane, and Country Districts. Okay? They then integrated a Zimbabwe Mashan Lane under 24 side, which was captained by Grant Flower uh, in that scenario. But predominantly it was three sides. So what it meant was, when Zimbabwe cricket played first class cricket, there were only 33 people. So what it meant was, when I opened the batting for Mashana on 24th against Mashana, I was facing Dave Brown, Ed O'Brien, those kind of names. When I bowled, the batting line was Grant Flower opening, Dave Hudson batting at 4, Andy Flower at 3, Alistair Campbell at 5, Trevor Penny at 6. Then that's before you got to Paul Strang's East Street. So what it meant was an element on strength on strength. And if you could cope in that environment, you had half a chance of coping internationally. Now, my results, and I said this to you, my stats don't add up. You know, that the one disappointment in my whole career is, is actually my stats. I look at it and go, I could have been so much better. And I, and I don't think it was because of the system. I don't think it was because of my ability. That blame can only solely be put on me. I was lazy. I didn't work hard enough on my game. I didn't learn from an Andy Flower and a Don Flower who, if you want to talk work, work ethic, I mean, there were others in the side, um, but work ethic, you, you did not get better than those two. You would go to a fielding session, Andy Flower keeping. If you threw a ball and didn't hit him on the gloves and the top of the stumps, he'd tell you to cut your bag and go home. Because he did not accept mediocrity. Did not accept, it was not acceptable. And that is what carried into the game because mediocrity was not accepted. Now, either that broke you, what made you stronger. It never broke me. So on some levels, I coped with it. On other levels where I look back at my career, and, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, where, and I think we all do, in whatever walks of life we are, where, you know, I spent some money on buying a new iPhone. And later on, when I'm not gonna pay school fees, I'm like, why did I do that? You know, I look back at my career, and I think to myself, I could have been so much better. I was a promising youngster at school level, um, and, and without being arrogant, I was. I, I was good. I was a good young cricketer. And I think I left school thinking that I'd achieved. Uh, I'd done it. You know, I, I've made international cricket. That was only the start. It was only the start of where my career was meant to go. And, and that probably would have been the downfall, but I, I look at current cricket and I I think there's a very fine line in, in where Zimbabwe cricket has gone by establishing, what, four franchises? Um, that's 44 cricketers. Before you extend those squads, before you then say, well, when the national team's away, then we've got to bring in more guys. You know, it worked in the old days, and I know the schedules are a lot different. But we didn't play first-class cricket if the national team was away. And we fitted it into that section. But is there maybe a call that Zimbabwe could need to have a look at going, how do we get strength on strength? So that when Ravimbo is on the fringe of making a team, the first step is, if you cannot make a franchise side, because there's only 33 players, how do you expect to make a national side? 
and so, that's key and that's key i think i want to quickly rush on to that i i was looking at some of um, your stats you had this wonderful partnership with craig uh, evans in in a big win that you had against Matabin and i believe it must have been around about year 2000 yeah. um you scored 173 not out in that one and while well, we went on to decimate uh, Matabil and which had the likes of uh, the Gavin Rennies I believe back then. Um, you are talking about this going all the way up and building those stats at that particular level. Now let me quickly rush you into your first test debut. Um, of course it wasn't the greatest experience but do you feel that maybe the selectors rushed you into an opening batting position, particularly considering the kind of opposition you were facing? 100%. And, and I think if you, if one of your interviews is going to be Alistair Campbell, who was captain at the time, you can ask him. He actually went to the selectors and went, what are you guys doing? Why, why are you making an opening batting? You just as your lamp to the slaughter. And, and I guess at the time, because of egos and personalities, you know, you don't want to hear that as that person because you're like, what are you telling me? I'm not good enough. Yeah. The reality was, he looked at me and he went, yeah, you're not. You're not good enough to open. I mean, that, that bowling attack was Wako Yunus, was in at home, and show back up. You're telling me you're good enough? You, you had just returned from New Zealand, I was batting number seven, and now you're going to open against that Pakistan lineup. Before you spoke about Mushtaq, who was the next one never got to him <laughs> but but the point was and I I look back at it and I actually had an interview with a, an Indian reporter a couple of months ago because when Zimbabwe played against Afghanistan uh, in Dubai in the test match the one opening batsman from Afghanistan got a pair on day so he phoned me from India and he was like do you have any like words of knowledge for this guy <laughs> and I said to him you know what it's not gonna be your first duck and it's definitely not gonna be your last duck. <laughs> What you have to take from that is, is this going to break you or is it going to make you stronger? And if it's going to break you, then I really feel sorry for you. But you have to look at the positive side and, and this is either going to make me stronger to want to achieve and be better and prove to one Alistair Campbell who said I shouldn't have done it because he said I wasn't good enough, or the selectors that I can do that and I want you to give me another chance. Um, and that's not a dig, you know, my, my point of me saying ask Alex Campbell. In hindsight I agree with you. Should never have done that. But to go to selection and go no thanks. There's an opportunity for you to make your test debut. That's that's what we look for in our careers is the pinnacle. The only other pinnacle of, of making your international debut is going to a World Cup. And you go, well you know, I'm not so sure if I'm good enough, so leave me out of the World Cup spot. So and I look back at that and people I mean people laugh at me and I I suppose the one issue that I do suffer from is that when I talk to people about my career, that always comes up. But I think I have the personality that that's not a dig at me. I laugh with them. I'm like, yeah, cheapest. Can I put you in front of the show back to <laughs> Let's see what you see what you do. So I look back at it and go, maybe at the time it was a bit sort of hard for me to stomach what had happened and, and the build up to that and actually walking out. I think Alistair Campbell used to let you shove me out the door. I was like, no, 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 no I'm not going. He had to push me out the door. Um, but I look back at that and go, you know what, it's part of life learning lessons and, and I believe it makes us stronger whether I take that into my current family life or whatever. It was something that challenged me and, and I didn't come through it, but I learned it. Alright, well, there's, um, of course you had a more, a longer ODI career than, um, than the test side of things. And I want to bring you back to a particular match um, you were playing in Australia, you were batting alongside Doug Marillia. You guys were really close uh, to, to winning that one. Unfortunately, you did lose that one. Uh, but um, what was it like standing on the other end, watching Doug Marillia do <laughs> the deal? <laughs> well, they now call it the deal scoop. I feel it should the be the Marillia scoop, scoop. Okay. Yeah, or the Dougie scoop. Uh, but. Um, what was it like there and what do you think you guys could have done differently to win that match since you came so, so close, uh, particularly against an Australian side? That would have been historic. Well, I'll give you a bit of background to that incident and, and maybe for those people watching this uh, who know about that, it's actually on YouTube and someone spread it around a couple of weeks ago. Um, two, two points of fact in that game. So I think it was 301 Australia got 
And nowadays 301 is, is pretty much standard. Uh, 301 back in 2000, 2001 was like un unattainable. No one was going to win that. So I think that helped us a little bit in the change room because there wasn't the pressure of expectation. The pressure of expectation was, guys, let's not totally embarrass ourselves. 301 in, in the current environment of world cricket. I think if I look back at, at my bowling figures, you know, if, if you if your economy rate was over four, you're quite an expensive bowler. You know, nowadays, if you anywhere near four, you're like the top bowler in the world. So things were very different in those days. I still remember. I think I think Doug Marillia was batting seven. I was batting eight, and we were at the back of the change room at the Wacker, which was sort of like steps within the change room. So if you sat in the front, we could see over your head. And he was in the back, and both of us had our pads on. He was in next. He had his gloves on, his helmet, and we were chatting. And he said, "So what I'm going to do is, when I go out there, the deck, I'm just going to sweep down the ground." So I had a bit of a big yeah. <laughs> and everyone laughed. And Andy Flower stood up and he went, You two, this is not a joke. You're representing the country. And if you think this is a joke, you'll never play for this country. And he sat down. So there we were, like two school kids. <laughs> sat in the front. And I looked at him, and he looked at me. Anyway, next minute, someone got out. Stuart Carlisle batted really well in that game, he got 100. And got down to that last over because we lost two quick wickets. And both of him, him and I, I think, were in that last over, both on naught, hadn't faced the ball. So I said to him, What are you going to do? He goes, Well, you're not paying attention to what I told you up there. I'm going to sweep him. I'm like, Dude, you can't sweep him. This is the most bounciest wicket in the world. And we're talking about Glenn McGrath. He looked at me and he went, Don't stand over there. And so he parted. First ball swept him went for four. So I walked down, I think my eyes were about this big. I said, what are you going to do? Next ball. I'm shooting the game. <laughs> so he did. If you watch that video, after he played, I think he did two in a row. So I take blame for that. Yes. So, so after that, if you watch the video, there's a segment within the space of that ball and the next one, where I'm standing next to him with my hand on his shoulder. And basically what we discussed, I said to him, there's no way you can sweep this guy through balls. And he went, why? I said, because Glenn McGrath has been and still is the number one bowler in the world. There's no way he's bowling up there again. Yeah. The next ball's coming through. Him. And he goes, he's not going to bowl me. He's going to bowl me another Yorker. That's what Glenn McGrath does. I said, Doug, he's not going to bowl you three Yorkers in a row and just allow you to do this for six balls and win the game. He's going to try something different. So I said, do me a favor, it's going to be length, hit him down the ground. And that was when I had my hand on his shoulder. Anyway, Glenn McGraw ran in. Doug Murillo changed his mind, he was going to shoot him. He listened to him, and the next ball he bowled him another Yorker, and Doug Murillo tried to hit him straight. And if Doug Murillo, if I just said to him, you know what, I'm not even telling you, just go and stand there and do what you need to do, he probably would have won that game. So I, I do take a bit of responsibility for losing by one run. It was me. <laughs> and I think if you spoke to Doug Marillia, yeah. he'd probably go to do it for the insult. <laughs> so there you go. He knows what he did. Yeah. <laughs> but um, also then again, uh, let's, let's also quickly look at um, ODI because that's where you had the longer career. Uh, particularly in your bowling figures, they, they were okay. I mean, they were pretty decent. You were picked up 44 wickets. Uh, as well, uh, tell me a match which you feel was memorable, um, particularly in the one that you won as a Zimbabwe. So, if you if you look back at my career, which the stats probably won't tell, but if you followed and, and watched my career, I I was never picked as a bowler. I started my career as a batsman, and I only made my debut by default. Um, I flew to uh, Sharjah. 1997 because Dave Houghton was having I think his last child at the time uh, so they sent me as a sort of youngster to go and learn um, we arrived in Sharjah had a practice session they picked a team for the next morning it was against Sri Lanka um, and 
we were all fine. Gary Brent and I were sitting out. We were the youngsters. I, mean, I, I was 19 years old. And um, we woke up the next morning, got on the bus, and I think Andy Flower was captain. We walked in the huge plane. And I was like, what? Yeah. He said, um, Guy Whittle has malaria. So he's out. Uh, you're playing. So, so that's how I made my debut. I batted, I think, at number four. Um, and then played a couple of games just as a sort of lower order batsman and one of the most memorable bowling performances was actually the first time I bowled in international. Uh, we were playing against New Zealand and Nathan Astle and I think it was a guy by the name of Roger Twos. He was a left-handed big guy and we'd got about 230 on a very small ground I think it was in Canterbury. The old stadium not the new one and obviously uh, as a squad member when you had practice you've batted we need bowlers go and bowl so i used to bowl my whole career i was an all-rounder except in the national team and we were getting pinged we were getting smacked all over the place there i was fielding a club corner or whatever and new zealand crowd were going crazy uh, because they were just giving us a high level. nathan master was just smashing us everywhere and the next minute End of the over, we were walking, and Alistair Campbell, who was captain, never really left the middle. The boundary was too far for him to run. <laughs> you, come here. And I'm like, sure, what's up? He goes, yeah, bowl. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> he goes, bowl. I'm like, what do you want me to bowl? He goes, just bowl, like you bowled to us yesterday in the next. I said, what do you mean? He goes, just bowl at legs, stump, as full as you can, okay? And get me through as many overs as I can. I'm out of ideas. I think my second ball, uh, he said, I'm going to go and stand over there and catch like a silly middle, a little bit further back. And that was going to go off. But I think my second ball, he hit it straight to the to come as the first ball. In the end, we beat New Zealand by a couple of runs. I think I finished with, I want to say a ball 10. It might have been close. 2 for 18, 10 overs. I, just, I took the stump that day. So that was probably, from a bowling perspective, one of my most memorable the first time I bowled, it was twofold. It was one that I bowled my whole life. Schoolboy, provincial, A-side. I played as an all-rounder. And all of a sudden, like, I think it gave me this like new lease because I, I hadn't had the string to my bow. I, I could try and contribute on both sides. Because at that time, I mean, I, I've got a couple of 17s and 20s and 30s with a bat, but I was no Andy Flower. I was no Grand Flower. I was no Alistair Campbell with a bat. Maybe my time would have come. But all of a sudden, you know, we, we went from then having myself, Grand Flower, Paul Strand, Keith Street, um, all as all-rounders, you know, guys who could bowl and guys who could bat. And I think it changed the dimension of what that Zimbabwe makeup was because prior to that and, and me developing that string to my bow, you know, you're a batsman. Where are you going to bat? Oh, should we try and squeeze him in that seven? No, but let's play that guy because he's batting better. All of a sudden now, even though we were mixing and matching, you know, Paul Strang, myself, and, and his streak sort of strengthened the, the, the tail because we could all bowl. And I think it changed a little bit of the dimension of the structure of the side. Yeah, definitely interesting. Uh, I mean, interesting times, yeah, and uh, as we said, he's still at fault for that, but anyway, he's already taken the blame for that one. But as we're landing the show here, Dirk, um, your final international game was against England. Um, what, what did it feel like uh, leaving the game that you loved? Was it more of a decision that you had to make in order to progress to another part? of the life that you now kind of have? Or was it just time to say, look, I, I think we're done now? Without sitting here for another three days and going into <laughs> the reasons of my retirement, I retired very well. Um, do I have regrets for that? I do only have regrets because, and, and I'll, I'll harp on about it, my, my stats, um, I believe don't do me justice of the cricketer that I, I, I was when I was young and potentially could have been when I matured. Uh, you know, I always look back on the example of Mike Hussey who made his international debut when he was 30. I retired at the age of 25. Retired. You know, 
I made my debut when I was 18, 19 years old. So, so if I had any regrets, one would be is how much more mature would I have been if I played for another six years? Jimmy Anderson is currently four. I still have 15 years of my international career. So I look back only as more as sliding doors. How many test matches could I have played? How many one days could I have played? Could I ever have gone on test matches? Maybe I could have. My, my one aim and, and the one box I wanted to tick, which was obvious, I wanted an international one, which I never got. I wanted to captain this one. And I, I believed that when I was growing up, that I was good enough to do it. I think I had a cricket brain that I captained Zimbabwe A for many years, that one of my ambitions was to captain my team. I wanted to captain my national side. I never got to do that. Do I look back and go, well, I shouldn't have done that. It was a bad decision. Um, you know, I have a wife, I have two kids, and, and I look back at the current, I mean, I would have finished by now, but I look back at the current scenario of world cricket and, and, and how stressful it is and the bubbles have made it worse. Being away from your family, I don't think I would have coped. So I look back at that and I don't regret the decisions I made to where I am now and, and, and being with my family and, and progressed in my life. But I do look back and go, you know, has, has my career, if you Google me, should still have an asterisk there? Because I'm not finished. I'm not out. I, I, I still have more to offer. But I guess there's things that you can offer. There's things that you can offer from coaching. There's things that you can offer from management. There's, there's things that you can offer from um, consultation. And, and I'm very lucky that from my playing days and, and the, the, the friendships that I've made, you know, I'm, I'm still working at the moment with uh, uh, Gary Brent and Alistair Campbell in, in the High Performance Centre they're running. And, and I guess part of it is because I have a son now who's 14 years old. And he's into his cricket, and he represented Zimbabwe for the last two years and got selected. And, and he's going through what I went through. You know, I want to be able to offer him that. So I think the fact that I'm still in the game and I'm still there, it's not necessarily running on and, and representing my nation. My the end of my career, I think I did it properly. Um, I made that decision, and I walked away. I didn't harp on about it. I didn't think of coming back from retirement. I cut it very clearly with a scope saying as of today this is the end i went to zimbabwe cricket gave back all my sponsored gear gave back my sponsored car everything i had and i drew a line in the sand i think if i'd done it willy nilly that would have been really tough should i retire I'm thinking of retiring i woke up one morning and i said i'm done and i think that made the transition really easy. yeah definitely a tough decision that you had to make but ultimately were all enjoying uh, the fruits of it, seeing how you've been also been working in the commentary section and, and offering all this consultation. And I'm sure all of the youngsters coming up will be better for it, uh, particularly with the advice that you give. Unfortunately, Dirk, as you said, we can be here for three days and we can continuously talk about so many things that, that uh, should happen, would need to happen. But finally, finally, the big news broke out uh, Sean Williams will be stepping away from international cricket. I mean, in just your own assessment, how big a blow do you think it is to this current national team setup, considering some of the uh, youngsters that have now walked in that would have really benefited from his experience and his quality as a player? Look, I think it's huge. I think one thing to also remember, when Dirk Fillion retired, the world of cricket carried on. <laughs> When Andy Flower retired, the world of cricket carried on. And even some bigger names than Andy Flower when they retired, the world of cricket carried on. So that's the beauty about sport. Sport doesn't wait for anyone. Because the beast retired from the Springboks, we don't shut down the whole system because the beast retired. That's life. So I think from that scenario is maybe just more understanding and I'm not saying we need to understand this as the public. We'd like to know why. Um, but from Zimbabwe cricket, understanding a little bit more on why has he retired? Because is it something caused by us? It very well might not be. Take, understand, and I said to you about my kids. He's now married. He has a child. This bubble scenario is killing sports people mentally. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. We understand the reason for the bubble. But you just get to a stage of going, I cannot do that anymore. It's eating me up. 
the amount of travel we're doing, I'm away from my kids. That's why I stopped commentary in Asia. It's too much for me. My kids were three, four years old. I just don't want to do it anymore. So there's a very good chance it's that. If there is an element of him being disgruntled with Zimbabwe cricket, then Zimbabwe cricket need to fix that. They need to understand that as you have these player exoduses, the good work that you have done over the last couple of years kicks you all the way back again. And you start all over. There's also a very fine line which Zimbabwe cricket need to be careful of, is that the world doesn't, or Zimbabwe cricket doesn't revolve around the players. Okay, so there's no sacrificial lambs here. There's no um, put you on your white pedestal and whatever the player said goes. Zetsi are there to manage cricket. It's just what you decide on how to manage it. Because the minute the players think that they have full control, then it goes the other way. And Zimbabwe creates a mess in England. So I just hope that, you know, him and his announcement cannot be fixed. I think he still has so much to offer. I think he's a great cricketer. And I think, ironically, like I said to you, I hadn't matured in my career, I was 24. In my opinion, Sean Williams is playing the best cricket of his life. So that makes it more difficult, he's at that age. And at this age is where he sort of knows he's sort of phasing out. Those youngsters need to learn from him. And if he disappears, and then the next goes and the next goes, we go back to where we were a couple of years ago, where you're chucking guys in the deep end for no other reason, but you guys have to go in front up. So it, it is a precarious one. Uh, I hope that Zimbabwe Cricket and Sean Williams and the rest of them, because the rumor is, and I haven't heard for a fact, that maybe there'll be more, that they can sit down and find some kind of solution that they can all work together. Because whether you like it or not, and whether you say it to him, Sean Williams, Brennan Taylor, even though Raza, Craig Irvin, they're getting a bit long in the tooth and they're getting towards in their career, they still have so much to offer. How can we find a way that we can still work with you guys because that knowledge has to be passed on to the youngsters they can proceed, even down to, can you just play franchise cricket for us so that these youngsters can learn from you? So I hope that there's not a bun fight between the two and like I said, there's always two sides to a story. I'm not taking any one side, there's always two sides. Until those two sides are met and both parties can agree that yes, there are two sides, and yeah, I was maybe wrong, yeah, I was maybe wrong, but how do we find a workable solution? That's what it is, what different to uh, being married? You know, we fight, but I'm not always right, my wife's not always right. There's always two sides to a story. So at the moment, I'm not looking too deep into it, but yeah, I do fear that if Brennan, if he does go and the rest start following, where does Zimbabwe go from there? They need that experience, and you can't, you can't buy that experience, you can't study for that experience. That is over 10 years of that guy's career that he's got it. How do you tap out of it? Because you paid for it as Zimbabwe career. You need to harness that and use it. How are you going to use it? Because him just going, I'm done, going, ah, okay, it's fine, you're done. That doesn't solve it. So I hope they fix it. Yeah, well, definitely we hope that that is fixed. But this brings us to the end of the Extra Sports feature with Dirk Villian, former Zimbabwe cricketer and now family man media guy all sorts of things that he does but thank you so much Dirk for for your time and uh, and of course your thoughts well absolute pleasure and, and to you as well as a, as a media guy you know thank you for when I say exposing I don't mean that in a horrible way but you know exposing uh, whether they ex sportsmen or, or uh, whether they were good or bad you know would love to interview Andy Flower, but unfortunately you were left with me. Um, because I think that's what it's about. The culture is built from people hearing those kind of stories. And, and we're not when we's, but you know, we did things differently and, and times have changed, but we still have a passion for our nation. We have a, a passion for Zimbabwe to get to do well and, and whether it's rugby like Sean D'Souza, I watched that. And, and you see that guy's passion. We need that in Zimbabwe. And, and thank you for you guys as the media fraternity for highlighting that stuff because we need more of it. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So make sure you stay locked on to the Sports Extra YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe, to comment as well on this particular video. We'll send all of that feedback back uh, to Dirk as well. And maybe he can give us more. But until next time, cheerio. <laughs>